General Futures U.S. Army Training and Doctrine Command last July. Before that, he served as Commanding General Maneuver Center of Excellence. He previously served as Commander uh, of Combined Joint Interagency Task Force in Kabul, Afghanistan. General McMaster is a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy and holds a Ph.D. in Military History from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. In fact, he was an assistant professor of history at the U.S. Military Academy from 1994 to 1996. His military education and training includes the Airborne and Ranger Schools, the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College, and a U.S. Army War College Fellowship at the Cooper Institution on War, Revolution, and Peace. General McMaster's previous command assignments have taken him to Germany, to Southwest Asia during the 1991 Gulf War. He was with the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment in Colorado and in Iraq from 2004 to 2006. Staff assignments include Director of Concepts, Development, and Learning at TRADOC from 2008 to 2010, and Special Assistant to the Commander of Multinational Force Iraq in 2003-2004. It is truly an impressive bio, and we're incredibly fortunate to have General McMaster with us. Please join me in welcoming General McMaster. it is to be with all of you, and I know I speak for all of, our, all of my American colleagues that I know we're going to get a lot more out of this conference than we're able to contribute ourselves. So I just want to thank everyone for putting this together. Dr. Von Plocki, thank you for the real privilege of participating today. Uh, and General Thibault, uh, Thibault uh, General Lantier, and, uh, and General Bose. Uh, it's a privilege always to be here with the Canadian Army and Canadian Armed Forces, you know, and and, uh, and it's a real privilege to be here, really, so close to the 100-year anniversary of, uh, of, of the Battle of Ypres, uh, which reminds me, you know, at, and all of, I think, all of my American colleagues that, that it is such a privilege to serve alongside the Canadian Armed Forces. And it's the Canadian Armed Forces who inspire us, I think, with their example of, of courage, uh, dedication, and professionalism. You know, uh, General Thibault mentioned, you know, you know his, his hockey team, the Canadians, now an old Flyers fan, you know, the Broad Street Bullies, you know, <laughs> get a little nostalgic about it. But uh, maybe once again, we'll return to, that, to the same level of play and, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, and I think toughness and, and determination. But, you know, the, the, the player that you value, whether it's, you know, whether it's uh, on the battlefield uh, or in, on the hockey rink, is the player who makes everybody else better. And that's been my experience with the Canadian Armed Forces, is that whenever you have a Canadian officer, leader, sergeant with you, they make everybody else better, you know, and, and I think, uh, I, you know, I, I speak for all of Americans to say how much we're inspired by you every day, how much, how, how, how grateful we are for your invaluable contributions in places like Iraq again today uh, and, and Afghanistan and, and elsewhere. So today, today's topic, the topic for this conference, I think is immensely important to both our armed forces, and, and I think it, what will be especially fruitful for us is to continue to work together as we have uh, on future force development to ensure that in the future that we're able to accomplish the mission against increasingly, I think, uh, brutal, capable, and elusive enemies, and that we're able to operate effectively as a multinational team. As today, as we can see quite readily just by looking at the, the headlines, uh, watching the CNN special last night, for example, that we're facing these enemies who are really the enemies of all civilized people. So how, how do we apply uh, autonomy, enabled systems, and robotics to help make us more effective in really preserving and protecting humanity uh, from the enemies that we're facing. So what I'd, what I'd like to do is offer a framework for thinking about how to apply robotics and autonomous systems, and maybe these are, are themes that can be carried through the conference, although I must say that, uh, that General uh, Thibault's five uh, considerations I think are superior to these, to these four elements I'd like to talk about, and he's laid out, I think, very succinctly uh, a, a great analytical framework for thinking about how to apply robotics and autonomous systems uh, to future missions. But the first consideration is I think we have to think in terms of change 
in terms of what these technologies allow us to do and allow us to do differently, but also balance that with a consideration of continuities. Continuities in the nature of war that limit the, what we tend to think of as, as revolutionary effects of new technologies. So for, do we think autonomous and robotic systems are revolutionary? I would say that if you, if you consider revolutionary as changing fundamentally the nature of war, no. I don't think they are revolutionary. Do they represent important capabilities? Yes, and I'll, I'll talk more about that later. But robotics and autonomy-enabled systems do not change the fundamental nature of war. And I'd like to really highlight four continuities in the nature of war that I think should serve as, as limits, limits to our enthusiasm oftentimes about what new technology can bring to bear in future conflicts. The first, none of these will be you know, new to anyone in this room. But the first is that war is an extension of politics, which means why do we go to war, really, to achieve sustainable, usually political outcomes consistent with our vital interests. And to do that, we have to influence behavior. We have to consolidate military gains politically as an integral part of war. And so we have to recognize that, that those sorts of key military functions that our militaries have always had to do, even when we don't want to do them, involving you know, military support to governance and, and rule of law, uh, involving the development of indigenous security forces, you know, the, the, uh, all of the broad range of activities necessary to consolidate military gains. The second continuity that we have to consider is that, is that war is profoundly human, and especially in connection with why people fight, right, and why organizations fight. For the same reasons Thucydides identified 2,500 years ago, fear, honor, and interest, and what is the degree to which robotics and autonomy systems and autonomous systems can affect what's motivating people in conflict? And I think what comes out of that analysis are limitations uh, as well. And of course, another aspect of the human dimension of war is that we have to consider what effects we want to have on enemy organizations, but also what effects we need to have on our allies, our partners, uh, and on neutrals in conflict as well. The third continuity in, in the nature of war is war's uncertainty. War's uncertain, I think, because of the first two factors. It's political and human dimension complicates the heck out of war. But it's also uncertain because of the interaction with the enemies inside of conflicts, as well as the interaction with adversaries in between conflicts. And as Clausewitz said, in war, each side tries to outdo the other. So we have to consider, really, what are countermeasures, and I'll, and I'll, talk, I'll talk more about that. But also what's making war uncertain are a lot of the technological innovations that have actually made war more complex and more uncertain. Remember the orthodoxy of the 1990s, right? Advances in, in surveillance capabilities, information ca collection capabilities, computing power, you know, Moore's laws applied to war was going to could shift war fundamentally from the realm of uncertainty to the realm of certainty. Remember the language associated with this and the dominant battle space knowledge and decision dominance and everything. So, so but, but of course, you know, what, what's happened is quite the opposite. In fact, and, and a great you know, historian of, of technology recognized this in the 1960s. And I'll just quote from Elting Morrison in Men, Machines, and Modern Times. I think this is very relevant to robotics and, and autonomous systems. He said that we may be caught in the irony that at the very moment when by our wit we have developed the means to give us considerable control over our resistant natural environment, we, have, we find we have produced in the means themselves an artificial environment of such complication that we cannot control it. And so war will remain uncertain because of its complexity, because of the interaction with enemies, and in large measure because of the technologies that we're developing uh, with an eye toward simplifying war and making more, more, more uncertain. It's having quite the opposite effect. And then, and then finally, war is a contest of, of wills. How do, does the application of, 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 of autonomous, semi-autonomous systems, robotics, affect war as fundamentally a contest of wills? So I think we have to consider these technologies in the context of, of, both, of, of both continuity and change. And as, as General Thibault said at, at the beginning, you know, I think we have to consider what is the effect of autonomy and, and robotics, you know, in, in each of the different domains. 
And I think for, for the Army, our armies, we have to consider what makes conflict on, on land different from conflict in the relatively fluid media of the maritime, air, space, and maybe even cyberspace domains. And as the, as the historian of technology, Alex Rowland, mentioned, he said, land warfare is simply less technologically based than naval warfare or air warfare. And of course, you know, without ships, there is no naval warfare. Without planes, there's no air warfare. In those realms, the vehicle is the sine qua non of combat itself, an integral part of how to fight. Choose battleships or submarines and you choose your strategy. Choose bombers or fighters or, I would say, drones, right? And, and you similarly define the game. But land warfare can go without its vehicles. As a fact, it, it has done so throughout most of its history. So regardless of their arms and armor, troops can still line up in a field and have at each other. And so it's geography that complicates war on land. It's the presence of people and non-combatants. It's the, it's the difference in maybe the sheer numbers of what some people would like to regard as targets. On land, they're people, and they're not really targets. They're actually doing everything they can to avoid being classified as such. And so as we look at autonomy-enabled systems robots, we have to think about, as General Thibault said at the very beginning, what is, what is the different application in each, of these, in each of these domains. And so continuity is important to consider when we're thinking about change in technology and the effect that change in technology can have on the nature of war. So if war uh, is not going to be revolutionized, Will, what effect will it have? And this is the second consideration, I think, is, is what is what effect will autonomous systems, autonomy-enabled systems and robotics have on the character of armed conflict? And I would say it's profoundly an, an important, a profoundly important evolutionary effect. And so I think it's important for us to learn from previous so-called revolutions in military affairs. And I think there's a great book. You, all you have to do is read the last two pages of it if you want to get the Cliff Notes version. It's by McGregor Knox and, and Williamson Murray called Revolutions in Military Affairs, 1300 to 2050. And, and essentially what, what these two historians found is four distinguishing characteristics of RMAs or really effective military innova innovation. The first distinguishing characteristic is that technology alone has rarely driven them. So it's really technology in context of changes in doctrine and organization and training and leader development, right? The second consideration is that revolutions in military affairs have emerged from evolutionary problem solving against real enemies and real theaters. And so for us, in our army, what we've endeavored to do is to think in a more systematic way about evolutionary changes in our capabilities. And so what we have offered in our the highly readable Army operating concept, which you have in your packet just in time for the beach uh, to, to bring with you. So, is, is, uh, is we have said, okay, as Sir Michael Howard has said, you're never going to get it exactly right about future war. I mean, the key is to not be so far off the mark that you can't adjust to the actual demands of, of, of that conflict once they reveal themselves to you. So, we have said, well, maybe the first step then, the first step in, in evolving our capabilities is just to ask the right questions. And so what we offer in Annex B is a description of how we go from concepts to capabilities are 20 first order questions, the answers to which will improve current and future force combat effectiveness. And so what I would recommend with robotics and autonomy enabled systems is that we consider the influence of these systems and capabilities, technological capabilities, on those questions. So for example, this, uh, how do robots and, and autonomous systems apply to what the Army has to do? So one of these war fighting challenges is, for example, and I'll highlight just four areas, how to develop and sustain a high degree of situational understanding in complex environments and against adaptive enemies. So what is the role of, of autonomy-enabled systems and, and robotics in, in this connection? Well, first of all, I think it's the area of reconnaissance, right? How you could employ air, ground, subterranean systems to provide early warning of enemy activity, enemies that are maybe blended in with populations and are, 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 are you know, evading your, your long-range surveillance capabilities, 
To do what? To allow you to make contact with that enemy under favorable conditions. And to, to allow you to protect maybe against, against tactical <coughs> surprise. I mean, can you, can, you, can you assume that's going to be the case? Probably not. And I'll talk more about countermeasures. But I think that's one key area. Of course, we've already used robots and are using robots every day uh, in, 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 the, in the air domain and on the ground, right, to, to, to help identify enemy activity, uh, IEDs, roadside bombs, and so forth. The second war fighting challenge where we think robotics and autonomy enable systems will have a big impact is our ability to, to, to secure wide areas, right? So army forces have to conduct operations to do what? Defeat the enemy, but then also to establish control of territory and protect populations, to, to deny the use of that territory to enemies, and to consolidate military gains politically. So that's a tough task oftentimes, and it's really when our enemies often times can challenge our initiative because we're operating across wide areas. So autonomy enabled systems can help us, I think, see across these wider areas. They can help us maybe operate more widely dispersed while maintaining mutual support between dispersed organizations. And we know that, that we can't just do this with autonomy, autonomous systems. We have to have really manned and unmanned teaming to be able to do that. But one of the things we learned, I think, in Iraq and Afghanistan is that if you move continuously through unsecured areas, you get blown up, right? So, so how do we improve our ability to secure these, these wide areas and, and autonomy enabled systems can help us? The third war fighting challenge is that we think this will have a big impact is how to sustain freedom of movement and action at the end of extended and contested lines of communication or supply lines in austere environments. And so autonomy enabled systems like this unmanned helicopter here, you know, like, uh, like uh, optionally manned logistics convoys can, can help us deliver, help us deliver logistical support in ways that are fundamentally different, I think. And so, so I think sustainment is a really key area for the application of these capabilities. And finally, in the conduct of combined arms maneuver, what we're calling joint combined arms operations. We think that autonomy enabled systems can pose some significant dilemmas to the enemy. Swarm technologies, for example, with, with uh, unmanned uh, aerial systems, ground systems that can, that can really um, pose at, at a lower risk to obviously lives of our soldiers some significant dilemmas to the enemy. Give us greater depth in our formations, uh, allow us maybe to prevent direct and indirect fire on our formations because we have greater depth with uh, autonomous and aut autonomy enabled systems. Maybe they can get at what Gen General Thibault mentioned is this need to really concentrate to be able to. To, to, to really compensate in some ways for the, the severe reductions in the size of land forces, which I think is I mean, something we might need to draw into question. I think if you look at the trends in warfare, we've been on sort of this linear trend where smaller land forces can have a greater and greater impact, and so you can economize the numbers. But what if that trend is reversing? What if that trend is reversing based on our ability to dominate in the relatively fluid media of the airspace, maritime domains, if that's increasingly challenged, and if our enemies are moving into restrictive terrain in urban areas, might we not need larger land forces in the future? I think, I think yes. Uh, does larger mean, uh, mean soldiers or autonomous systems? Uh, I think yes, actually, to both of those. And so, so what, what all these systems might allow us to do, and, and if we think and conceptually, is maybe elevate the tactics of infiltration to the operational level, right? Think of, you know, Napoleon's own campaign. Think of the Ludendorff offensives in World War I enabled by autonomous systems and the other technologies we have available today. So, so uh, one, one of the questions in terms of the evolution is, is can these systems substitute for, for manpower, woman power, soldier power? I would say that depends on really the application of the technology. So just think of infantry. We always hear, you know, brought up, you know, what about the size of the infantry squad? You know, can we make it smaller? And, and I would say, well, I mean, I personally believe that if you want to conduct fire and maneuver, that you need an infantry squad of at least nine soldiers. But but what about? It? But could they, could you enable that squad to be more effective with autonomous and robotic systems? Yes, I think so. Can you look at weapon squads, right? Where soldiers' roles in a weapon squad largely is, you know, carrying ammo carrying the tripod for the weapon system, maybe that's a place where you can save you know, manpower, for example, with autonomous systems. But we have to think about 
of the application of these systems and think about how it evolves our capabilities rather than maybe revolutionizes uh, our, our capabilities. The, uh, so so the, the, third, the third consideration is, is to make sure that we're considering countermeasures, countermeasures to these capabilities. And, and I think that we have to recognize that, you know, it's not just us who's innovating in this area, it's our, it's our enemies. I mean, how do we develop countermeasures to the swarm, UAS capabilities, and, uh, and un, unmanned systems? We have to recognize the interaction, again, with the enemy. There are no silver bullets, right, in war, and autonomy in robotics is not going to be a silver bullet, because you have the submarine, the sonar, the bomber, the radar, the machine gun, the tank, the tank, the anti-tank missile. And so we have to recognize that there will be countermeasures to these capabilities. What could some of them be? Well, if we become more dependent on robotics and autonomous systems, what is the effect of a cyber attack or electronic warfare that disrupts, really, the, the interaction of, of, with, of human beings with those systems? Could we make ourselves more vulnerable by, by being too enthusiastic uh, about, about autonomous and, and, and robotic systems and not recognizing what vulnerabilities they're building into, into our force potentially? So we have to recognize that these are challenges. And in Annex, Annex, uh, Annex C of the, again, the highly readable Army operating concept, we have, we have, uh, you know, we, we have some first principles for technology and its application uh, to, to, to uh, future force development for Army forces in, in particular. So we have to design systems that degrade gracefully as we apply, as we apply the, these systems to our, to our formations. We have to look, you know, we have to think about the future, I think, by walking backwards into it. Pay attention right now to what harbingers we see about, about robotics and, and semi-autonomous systems. I think we ought to look at really what, uh, what non-state actors even are doing with, uh, with or, you know, or, or state-sponsored actors are doing with UASs. I think we have to look at what Russia's done uh, in Crimea uh, with, uh, with UAS tied to fires capabilities uh, and, and also their ability to use electronic warfare. Uh, effectively, uh, in in in, uh, in Ukraine, and so I, so I think I think we have to recognize, right? We have to recognize why you know why land is different, obviously, but also think about it in terms of of these countermeasures. A way to do that, obviously, is through effective war gaming, effective experimentation, and so we one of the things we're we're doing very effectively with with uh, with Canadian Armed Forces is looking at this from a multinational perspective. The Army Expeditionary Warfighting Experiment is something I'd commend to you at Fort Benning, Georgia, which has done some great work, I think, in, in really recognizing that you know, we have to get technology into soldiers' hands quickly, you know, earlier in a, in a development process, because it's really for us on land, right, it's, it's combinations of, of, of well-trained soldiers and skilled, cohesive teams with technology. That's what gives us our differential advantage in combat on land. And then to consider that in our, in our experimentation in, 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 uh, under Unified Challenge, which is our, our use of constructive uh, and, and uh, simulation, uh, and, and, and our capstone event, which is the Army Warfighting Assessment, which Canadian Armed Forces are participating in, and I think it's going to be tr a tremendous exercise at Fort Bliss, Texas. Every October is where we can learn together, and, and we have some, some major objectives associated with autonomous and robotic systems uh, in line. Uh, for us in, in October, and the fourth, uh, the fourth consideration is 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 to consider uh, robotics and autonomy enabled systems in context of our humanity, right? And uh, and and General Tebow's already mentioned it. You know, um, it, it it is our warrior ethos that makes war less inhumane. And so, is the human space of conflict going to be squeezed out? Or what to, to what what degree? What is the degree to which it'll be squeezed out? by robotics and autonomous systems. And so, you know, I, I think, unfortunately, we recognize that we need war. You know, we need war. We need war because, you know, we, we are facing determined enemies uh, that I think pose a threat to all humanity. I think those threats are proliferating and they're becoming more dangerous. You know, whereas in the past, you know, <laughs> despite our unfortunate uh, differences between us, you know, in the, in the, in the late... Uh, 18th and early 19th centuries, you know, we've been able to depend in large measure on the, on the oceans on either side of, of, uh, of North America for our security. And, that, and of course, the, you know, the, the, the security that gives us is shrinking. We see that uh, be based on the transnational terrorist threat. Uh, we see that, obviously, most dramatically, uh, just to think back to September 11, 2001, 
uh, where it was a mass murder uh, that, that occurred on our continent. Uh, but we saw a harbinger of this in Pearl Harbor. Uh, we saw, obviously, you know, I think a, a, we see now a greater threat from long-range ballistic missiles uh, with countries like North Korea, you know, developing that capability tied to weapons of mass destruction. <coughs> so if we, if we, if we, um, if we recognize that we need war uh, to deter, hopefully, our allies, but then to respond to crises and be able to resolve conflict, uh, we ought to maybe ask a related question, you know, to what degree does war still need us, right? And, uh, and I think war does need, I think we both need war, as I've you know, mentioned for its deterrent effect, or as, or as G.K. Chesterton said famously, you know, <laughs> war is not the best way of settling differences, but often it's the only way to ensure that they're not settled for you, right? Um, but, but, but how can we ensure that we preserve, you know, our humanity in the conduct of, of, of war? And so I, I think a, a way for us to consider that is to, is to consider the three previous areas, continuities in the nature of war as we consider robotics and autonomous systems, to recognize that this will have an evolutionary effect on what our armed forces and for our army, what our army is for, and then, and then to recognize that there are countermeasures to these capabilities, to anticipate those so we understand the possibilities associated with these technologies, but also that we recognize the, the, the limitations. And so, so thank you so much for the opportunity to talk with you, and, and I'm really happy with the time remaining to hear what's on your mind and to see if you have any questions, comments, or advice uh, for, me, for me. Thank you. Steve. Okay, who, by the way, is one of those guys when I mentioned, you know, a Canadian who has a huge impact on organization and and uh, and we know that in C-Stick and TMA, uh, Canada really, I mean, really took on the, the, the huge burden there and, and had the great privilege of serving with Steve uh, in Afghanistan. Great to see you. Yeah, uh, Brigadier General Kelly Boyd, just to correct. Oh, Kelly, I'm sorry, yeah, Kelly. Yeah, I'm Steve. sorry. Yeah, I'm I think Steve Bowles. Kelly. <laughs> sorry, Kelly. No problem. One uh, of the things we, we look at is, is not only where we've been, and certainly as a professor of history and, and had a chance to chat with you in the past, a little, but what kind of drives us and where we go. And uh, I think we've got to look at our history, and certainly look, we've, we'll go back to my more recent uh, perspective in Afghanistan, and a lot of the stuff we were doing, a lot of the in-depth, in even some of the counter-corruption stuff that we were working together, where does this technology, even though it was already an existing, how do we in fact in, in put it in place? Because I think that's some of the challenges that this particular forum will talk a little bit about is the is a legal application, is the moral application. It's not even though if we've got it, but can you, we in fact use it? And is it going to be in a place where it's not going to be a risk more than it's going to be an advantage? And I think uh, from, from that perspective, certainly in where you've been before and where, where you're obviously working towards your development piece, where do you see us going and trying to deconflict that piece? That, that morale, morality piece, that legal aspect, because that will always be there. It will be one of the biggest uh, constraints, I think, in being able to actually really effectively use technology. Right. Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. And I think one of the, one of the key ways to do this is, is with scenarios, that try, the scenarios that try to get as best as they can at the real demands of future armed conflict. And I, I'm a big believer in, in grounded projections into the future. I think about 10 years out is a good window to, to base our scenarios on. And those scenarios ought to replicate the true nature of war and the political dimension of a conflict and, and begin with what is a strategic objective, what is a policy objective, and then how do we conduct military operations in a way that they're combined you know, with all the elements of national and international power to accomplish that objective. I think when we get in trouble, when we don't see some of the, either the possibilities associated with technologies or the limitations, it's when we divorce war from it's fundamentally what we're trying to achieve politically. So realistic scenarios, and I think there's some pretty easy ones you know, that you could look at. You know, everything from you know a rising power in Asia to a to a rogue state that's developing nuclear weapons in Northeast Asia uh, to a terrorist pseudo state in the Greater Middle East uh, to a, a a power that is trying to change 
uh, and, and challenge and collapse essentially the post-World War II, you know, political order on the Eurasian landmass. I mean, there are plenty of threats you know, to look at and, and to build real, realistic scenarios around. I mean, a, a Middle Eastern country that is, I think, perpetuating uh, sectarian violence and, 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 uh, and a humanitarian crisis of colossal scale in the greater Middle East and is also uh, developing some dangerous uh, weapons capabilities. So, so I think, I think you, we can develop scenarios and, and then be able to, to project what we see as enemy capabilities in the future, right? And build that into the enemy sort of force structure in the scenario. But then within our, within our own forces also project what we have budgeted in terms of our development. And then really see how it plays out and recognize that, that military operations and military effectiveness is limited, obviously, by those continuities in the nature of war. So I think really, you know, really good scenarios that, that, are, that are aimed at, at really concrete, tangible problems projected into the future and the right people there for that, for that war game or that experiment is critical. We can give you the insights. So, for example, you know, what Kelly and I were working on was, you know, uh, the, the threat of corruption and organized crime uh, to the Afghan forces. And, and uh, you know, there are all sorts of technological, you know, fixes to that, right? I mean, you know, more transparent means of paying people, you know, uh, you know, all sorts of, uh, of anti-corruption measures. But the problem fundamentally was one of political will. I mean, it really was, what was the, the, the problem was to convince key Afghan leaders that it was in their interest to take on the problem of corruption and, and organized crime in a country in, in which the political settlement, uh, the political accommodation internal to Afghanistan had become almost wholly dependent on unchecked criminality. So I, I think that as we look at technologies, we have to recognize that, again, enduring elements of the nature of war, in this case, the political and human you know, um, aspects of war, had limited the, you know, the, the effect of technology. Hi, so um, my question is, you know, we've been talking about the legal aspects and the moral um, ethical dilemmas uh, that will come with increased autonomous systems and things like that. But I'm wondering if that really falls equally across um, autonomous systems. So on the one hand, we have um, you know, systems that can do more of the logistical stuff, so self-driving cars, um, drones that will do ISR and things like that. And then we have on the other hand, the ones that we want us, that we're considering having, doing the killing for us. And so I'm wondering if the logistical ones will come a bit more easier, uh, more easily to the uh, military and to have um, an application there, uh, because we can sort of circumvent some of the debate um, if they're not doing really the more uh, contentious actions compared to the ones that'll be doing the killing. Right. Well, I mean, I, th I think that's, a, it's a, that's a, a good point. I mean, I think it'll be much easier, right, to apply technologies to, uh, you know, to logistics, for example. Although we have, you know, we have applied, you know, autonomy-enabled systems, you know, and to and drones in particular, uh, to to uh, to killing the enemy, you know, and and so and and, and, the, and these technologies they've had a profound effect. I don't mean to shortchange, you know, the effect that these systems have had on on tactical operations, in particular, in the conduct of, of war. So. I think the effect of information collection capabilities, uh, autonomy enabled systems, drones in particular that, are, that are, have lethal capabilities, have in essence in, in these areas, like for example in, in portions of Syria and Iraq, they have driven the identifiable fielded forces of our enemies off the open battlefield, right? That's an important effect, right, for how we operate. It's, it allows us, I think, to achieve a much greater effect with with uh, smaller ground forces who then can bring to bear these capabilities and who can, can have greater mutual support. Uh, but, but of course, the enemy countermeasures are traditional ones, dispersion, concealment, intermingling with civilian populations, and deception. And so it's this continuous interaction that I think we have to consider. So for example, if you want to apply a robot to logistical convoys, where you have optionally manned vehicles as part of those convoys, Enemy countermeasures, I think, would be to disrupt the movement of that force and and uh, and and uh, to make it difficult for you to navigate around maybe hastily constructed obstacles. You know, so you'd have to anticipate that. You have to anticipate also the de just the demands of the environment and maintenance, for example, you know, on those on those vehicles. So if you think that this is going to allow you to save, you know, a whole lot of 
of, of man and woman power, you know, uh, it, it may not have the effect that you're looking for. So, you know, I, I think that there are limitations, as you mentioned, uh, and and uh, and I, even even for logistics. They serve a major stock from the Air Warfare Center uh, down the road in Trenton here. Just a question on interoperability. Um, to what extent is the U.S. Army planning for the future, 10, 15, 20 years from now, planning to be interoperable not only jointly with your Army, Navy, SOF, but also with your combined, with your allies, right. Canada, etc.? If you could comment on that, sir. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, it's, it is a big focus for us, right? So what we have said, and again, the Army operating concept is, is really that, that Army forces uh, have to operate as part of joint interorganizational is the term now and multinational teams, right? And, and we say right up front in the document that you know American military power is joint power, right? So war, you know, to make it very simple, it, it's it's rock, it's the children's game of rock paper scissors, right? I mean, so if you have a rock, you know, which is uh, which is you know considerable air power capability, the ability to project power onto land from the air, uh, space, and maritime domains. You know, you, you force the enemy to, to take countermeasures, dispersion, concealment, intermingling with civilian populations, which is like their paper. And then your land forces your scissors to cope, to cope with that, for example. So we, we emphasize really four things in the Army operating concept. One is that we want to give multiple options to the National Command Authority, right, to the President, the Secretary of Defense, and to our combatant commanders. And we believe land forces do that because of what they bring that's, that's unique. I mean, land forces bring really, I think, the, the ability to compel outcomes without the cooperation of, of your enemies. Uh, land, land forces also bring the ability to, to conduct forward deterrence in a way that you can counter uh, an adversary like Russia, for example, has been there recently, which is to, to wage limited war for limited objectives, right? I mean, to, to grab eastern Ukraine at no cost, because there's no cost imposed at the frontier, and then to consolidate that gain and portray any reaction to that aggression as escalatory, you know? So, so land forces, I mean, bring that to bear. So multiple options. We want to create multiple dilemmas for the enemy. What we're saying, and this is where robotics and autonomy naval systems can help us. We say that American, you know, army forces in the future have to be capable of expeditionary maneuver. And that's not just getting there, you know, with, with a force. It's getting there with a force that has the appropriate combination of mobility, protection, and lethality and is capable of operating at sufficient scale and for ample duration to accomplish the mission. We want to be able to deploy those forces into unexpected locations and have those forces have the qualities of able to transition very quickly into maybe offensive operations, for example. This is in large measure to cope with the threat of long-range missiles, bad stuff that can emanate uh, from an enemy's territory or enemy-controlled territory, maybe in urban areas. So think of the V-1 and V-2 threat to London in World War II, Think of the Scud missile threat out of the desert of Iraq in 1991. Think of the rocket threat that Israel's dealt with from southern Lebanon and from Gaza. You know, we need army forces capable of operating part of joint teams that, that can cope with these kind of threats through expeditionary maneuver. So multiple uh, options, multiple dilemmas for, for the enemy, and then multiple partners. Multiple partners is one of those key areas that we have to be interoperable with interorganizational teams and multinational teams. We cannot envision a, a scenario where we're going to go to, go to, into conflict without, without partners. And, and it's obviously our uh, priority is working with our closest allies, our, the Canadian Armed Forces in particular, to ensure our interoperability. And then we, we talk in, in the concept about operating across multiple domains. And we think in the future, you know, this really gets to joint, future joint warfare, what we're calling joint combined arms maneuver is that land forces will have to increasingly in the future project power outward from land into the maritime, air, space, and cyberspace domains to ensure freedom of movement and action of the joint force because those domains are becoming more and, and more challenged. So uh, we have a warfighting challenge specifically on interoperability, but we work interoperability as part of each of those warfighting challenges. And I think if we can work together within this framework of the warfighting challenges, I think there are tremendous possibilities for us to, to ensure interoperability. So within each of these warfighting challenges, again, we're making this grounded projection into the future, and we're considering four things within each warfighting challenge. What are threats, enemies, and adversaries in that future operating environment? 
The second is missions. What kind of missions are we going to conduct in the future? The third is technology. What technologies can we apply to future force development? And also, they'll consider enemy technologies and countermeasures. Uh, and, and the fourth is history and lessons learned. What have we learned? And so we apply that kind of prism, that, that framework, to each warfighting challenge. And so we need to work together with you, as we are, continue working together with you, to assess, hey, how well can we, can we operate consistent with that warfighting challenge in, in the future? And then based on that assessment, come up with a learning campaign. So within each of these warfighting challenges, we've limited ourselves to 10 subordinate questions, learning demands, the answers to which will provide a partial interim solution to that warfighting challenge. And then, then we've developed interim solutions in near, mid, and far terms. And those are doctrine, organization, training, leader development, material, you know, policy, facilities, integrated, integrated solutions to those warfighting challenges. And so the rigor with which we do this, you know, is going to be very important. You know, the, the, the war gaming, the experimentation, the, the Army Warfighting Assessment I mentioned in Fort Bliss. And so we have, to, we have to learn, we have to think together, we have to learn together, and then we have to apply what we learn to future force development. And so we have a framework here, you know, to do that in, in the Army operating concept uh, and the way we're executing it, the way we're going from concepts to no kidding future capabilities. And we want to do that, you know, uh, together with, with our Canadian brothers and sisters in the Canadian Armed Forces. Thank you. Thank you.